I've been asked to speak to you tonight, all part of your series on the attributes of God, and I've been asked to speak, God is unchanging, or for the more technical amongst us, the immutability of God. That's what it means. God is unchanging. Now, I've got two readings. The first one is chapter one of the book of Hebrews, and the second one is part of chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews. So first of all, Hebrews chapter one, well-known chapter and uh, very much has something to do with our subject tonight. <clears throat> God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is, in, is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will grow old like a garment, but like a cloak, you will fold them up and they shall be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister? for those who will be in, will inherit salvation. Then if you'd like to turn over to Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to read to you the first eight verses, and you'll understand when we get to verse eight why I've chosen these verses. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them and those who have are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. May the Lord bless to us the public reading of his precious word. So the subject is, and I don't know what other attributes you've done recently, but this is one that affects them all. God 
is unchanging. God is unchanging. The immutability of God. Now, at the end of the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, <clears throat> there's a great verse. Chapter 3 and verse 6. And the Lord, he speaks about himself. And he says this. I am the Lord. I change not. Now, that's the authorized version. If you've got the New King James, it will say this. But I am the Lord. I do not change. Now, that's tremendous. That's what the Lord says about himself. He is unchangeable. Now, I don't know if you've realized this already as you've studied these attributes. But shall I tell you what you do happens when you study God? Because that's what we're doing. We're studying God. It will humble you, your mind. It will make you realize how small you are. In another sense, it will expand your mind because you'll learn about the greatness of God. It will bring great comfort to you. Shall I tell you why? Because if he's unchanging, that's wonderful, isn't it? And of course, from your soul, there will come worship to our great unchanging God. Now, you, we could have had a little quiz, you know. Now, some of the hymn writers, the old hymn writers, have got this truth wonderfully, haven't they, about an unchanging God. Remember, abide with me, change and decay in all around I see. Oh, thou who changest not, abide with me. That's a tremendous hymn, isn't it? What about... Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow. We're going to think about that in a moment. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Now, the hymn writer who got this great truth. And of course, there's that other lovely hymn, isn't there? How good is the God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend. No doubt there's a lot of other hymns as well, which convey, convey this wonderful truth about God being unchanging. And what they're conveying is this great truth. Now, perhaps one of the greatest statements on this wonderful subject is found in one of the Westminster Catechisms or Confessions. It asks a question. What is God? I wonder what your answer would be to that. What is God? Well, this is what those great men who put that confession together said. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Now, what a wonderful statement that is. It's summing up all the Bible's teaching about our unchangeable God. His attributes, his very person, cannot change. That's why he says in Malachi about himself, I am the Lord, I change not. Now, I've read this other verse, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. And once again, this is a tremendous statement. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, it doesn't say the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, because tomorrow will have an end. It says forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ cannot change. It does not change. And he will not change. And we'll think about that a, a bit later on. Now, we live in a changing world, don't we? Do you know, 50 years, 60 years ago, people were amazed. They could buy a television set and it was in black and white and everyone was marveling at a black and white television set 
But folk, here I am tonight, <laughs> coming over the internet. They wouldn't have dreamed of this. And I'm in colour. It's amazing, isn't it? How things have changed. Now, some of you, now forgive me for saying this, some of you once were young. But you're a bit like me, getting a bit ancient. We don't stay as we are. It's all part of the process of life. Change. Those of us who are Christians, spiritually, we know this experience, don't we? That we, we change. John Berridge was a Christian leader of the 18th century. He, he wrote, wrote tremendous hymns. And uh, he wrote these two verses in a hymn, summing up his spiritual state, how he was up and down. He says, brisk and dull in half an hour, hot and cold and sweet and sour, sometimes grave in Jesus school, sometimes light and plays the fool. What a motley wretch I'm I, full of inconsistency. Sure the plague is in my heart, else I could not act the part. And it's true, isn't it? Those of us who are Christians, one minute we can be hot for the Lord, then we can be cold, sweet, then sour. How changeable we are. But the Lord says of himself, I am the Lord. I do not change. Jesus Christ the same today, yes, today, yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. We used to sing a chorus many years ago. Do you remember it? Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Now, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to know that our God does not change. He, he cannot change. Now, remember that statement. It's worth thinking about that Westminster Confession statement. What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Now let's think about one or two things. And the first one we must say is this. God is unchangeable in his person, in his person. Now, if you turn to the book of James, chapter one, verse 17, there's a wonderful thing that thing that James says here. Now, it's not only talking about the unchangeableness of God, it's talking about the goodness of God. Cha James chapter one, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights. And it says this, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now, you can see what James is saying here. When we're out in the sunlight, when, when the sun shines, our body casts a shadow. Sometimes it, it's short because the sun is right overhead. Sometimes it, it's long. It varies depending where the sun is. Sometimes it's in front of us. Sometimes it's at the side of us. Sometimes it's behind us. There is this great variation to where our shadow will be. But James says, with God, there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is the same before he created this world. When he created this world throughout history, he will always be the same. There is no variation or changeableness with our Lord and saviour jesus christ someone put it like this god is incapable of change he is free from growth and decay he wants nothing and he loses nothing he cannot improve and he cannot deteriorate he is a unchanging god now this is very important teaching. 
Do you remember right there in the book of Genesis, chapter one, verse 27, it says, and God created man in his own image. Do you know what sinful, rebellious men and women do? And folk, we've all done it. We want to change God into our image so we can understand God. So we have a God that is suitable for our lifestyle. Now, of course, this is the teaching of scripture. Romans chapter one, verse 22. Now, can I just say, man is not neutral towards God. In his fallen state is always against God. And this is what Paul is teaching in the Romans about what the nature of man is like. Now listen to this. Romans chapter 1 verse 22. Professing to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up unto uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, and who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now that's the nature of man. He always wants to change our unchangeable God. Now, this amazingly doesn't just happen amongst false religions and wrong philosophies. This happens in the church, believe it or not. When I was a young Christian, I was converted. And, and shortly after, I, I started going to a local church. Really, it wasn't a church at all. Because the minister, one of the first things he said to me was, you can't believe all the Bible, you know. He says, we've got a lot more knowledge than John Wesley had. Oh, well, that's given away what denomination it was. And it went on to teach me about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. What it was, it was liberalism. It was universalism that we're all children of God. And he derided the atonement, Jesus dying for sinners the deity of Christ, all the supernatural of Christianity and the need to repent and believe and be born again. He changed the glory of our unchangeable God. Now, this is important instruction for us. That's why it's good to study the attributes of God, because you might hear people speak about God. You need to say, is this the God of the Bible? Is this the God who has revealed himself through Holy Scripture? God says, I am the Lord. I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. With him, there is no variation or shadow of turning. And that's a wonderful, wonderful teaching. And that's why we as Christians, we're so confident when we come to the Bible, we learn what God is really like. Now I come on to my second point, and it's God's word is unchanging. Now, if you'd like to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, once again, if God is unchanging, do you know what that means? He doesn't change his mind. <laughs> He doesn't lie. He doesn't think about, oh, I've got a new idea. He is constant. He is eternal. He never changes. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, Peter takes some verses from Isaiah chapter 40. And it's about the Bible and about man. Verse 24. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and its flower falleth away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. He goes on to say, now this is the word which 
by the gospel was preached to you. Now, they're the lovely verses. Do you know what your life is like? Well, that verse tells you, you're like a blade of grass. You grow up and you wither away. <laughs> That's life. You're like a flower. You grow up, you bloom, you're a beauty. But then you fade and wither away. Now that's that's what the book is saying. But God's word isn't like that. It never withers. It never fails. It endures forever. Now just imagine if you were in a time machine and you were able to go back three, four, five centuries. Do you know something? If you're a Christian, now you might end up in a bit of a culture which is a bit strange. <laughs> you might end up with people dressed differently than you are. You might look in their homes and things, cool, there's, where's the washing machine? Where's the television? There wouldn't be one. But if they're Christians, immediately you would be at one with them because you gather around the same book, around the same scriptures, and it's the word of God. And whatever generation there is, the word of God remains the word of God. It cannot change. It will not change because it's written by a God who doesn't change. Every generation has the privilege of having the word of God before them. The mind of God revealed, the voice of heaven sent to tell sinners of their need of a saviour, the truth of God in a world full of lies and a light in a dark, dark place. Now, a few moments ago, I said to you about that church I went to when I was a young Christian. Do you know something? I got in a real, conf got confused. Very, I mean, I was converted, but I was very confused with all this, what this man was telling me. And then I had a little bit of a dosing with the charismatic movement. I was in a right mess, really. But one night, I went along to the Bedford Young Life Group. And I sat next to a man who afterwards chatted to me about what the truth of God's word is. And he says, look, you start coming along to the Bible study. You start reading your Bible through and studying it. This will, will make you firm and strong in the Christian life. And all that confusion you'll just see to be error and lies. And you know something? He was right. That's when I began to grow. Because I placed my trust on a rock that cannot move. God's impregnable word. And that's where I began to grow as a Christian. And you know, folks, that's what builds us up. It's great meeting with these other people. It's great having new ideas to do things. But for what will build you up is God's unchangeable word. So God in his being is unchanging. God's word is unchanging. Now, I want you to turn to that chapter we read in chapter 13. Uh, no, chapter one of the book of Hebrews. Chapter one of the book of Hebrews. Look at verses 10, 11 and 12. Now, the, the writer here is quoting from Psalm 102. And he's speaking of God, the son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And first of all, in verse 10, he says, you, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. So the Lord Jesus is the great, powerful creator. Then it says, verse 11, they will perish, but you will remain. Now, that's an interesting statement. Our old world is going to perish. But our God is not going to perish. Then it says they will grow old like a garment. In other words, our world will wear out. Now, you'll have to ask Steve Taylor about climate change and see if that's referring to climate change or not. But look at verse 12. Like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. Now, this is wonderful teaching. 
God, the Lord Jesus Christ, created the world in all his power right at the beginning. There'll come a time when he will fold this old world up. In fact, the rest of scripture tells us it will be burnt up. But then he'll make a new heavens and a new earth. So there's going to be change. But the Lord, he doesn't change. He's as powerful as he was when he first created. And we will all witness his power when he creates a new heavens and a new earth. How God is he? Eternal and unchangeable. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 13. And there's three little observations I want to make from Hebrews chapter 13. Number one, God's law doesn't change. Now, the book of Hebrews is all about change, really. <laughs> you see, the ceremonial law, the temple, the tabernacle, all the furniture, the priesthood, that was all in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. That's what happened. But the writer to the Hebrew says it all pointed to Jesus. It's a shadow. It's a picture of Jesus. But now it's all finished. It's all finished. Because we don't want the picture. We don't want a shadow. We see the Lord Jesus Christ in all his wonderful person. And all his wonderful accomplishment at the cross of Calvary. So the ceremonial law is finished. But notice what he does in verse 4 and verse 5. Marriage is honourable among all the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. He's referring to the seventh commandment of the moral law. Look at verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Now, this is what the, 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 the writer is doing. He's saying, look, the ceremonial law is finished, but the Ten Commandments remain. Now, that's important teaching. God's law, God's moral law does not change. His standards were for his, what was for his people of old are for us as well. That's important. In my opinion, we've lost sight of this. That's why if you've done a study on the Ten Commandments, well done. And a few churches do. And that's why there's no fear of God in our churches today. So the Ten Commandments, they show us what sin is. But it also shows us the standard of God's holiness that he expects from his people. But look again at those verses. Look at the end of verse five. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. God's promises do not change. Do you know, I will not leave you nor forsake you. He said that to Joshua. Do you know what the writer to the Hebrews is saying? He's saying this. That's not just for Joshua. In the long distance past, it's for you. The Lord says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And this, this, this lovely verse from Psalm 118, he says, look, this is a lovely verse, but it wasn't just for the psalmist. It's for you. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Tomorrow I'm going to send that on an email. I know a man who's going through a difficult time in his work and I'm going to send that verse to him, which will help him to know that the Lord is his helper. And I might be speaking to someone tonight and you need help. Well, if you're a Christian, you've got help. The Lord is your helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. But then look at verse eight. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. Now, of course, our charismatic friends like thinking about this to justify their so-called miracles. But this verse is speaking about the, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of you who were at the preaching day the other week when Stuart Elliott spoke, he said we ought to read the Gospels 
to see how the Lord Jesus Christ preached. Well, that's true. But, you know, we ought to read the Gospels to see how the Lord Jesus Christ in his person dealt with individuals. Because our verse says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just think with me for a few moments. How patient the Lord Jesus Christ was with his disciples. <laughs> Wasn't he patient? And he's patient with us, isn't he? You think of his compassion on those who no one else wanted anything else to do with. But he's compassionate towards us, isn't he? His compassions, they fail not, the hymn writer said. Think of his goodness. Oh, what goodness. We don't deserve it, do we? But how good he's been to so many of us. His mercy. Oh, we deserve his judgment. But oh, what mercy he's shown. And think of the love. That love that never fails. It took him to the cross to suffer for the Christian's sin. And there on the cross, out of love for us, he punished in our place. He shed his blood to cleanse us from our sin. My dear friend, what a saviour we have. He loved us then and he loved us now. What a wonderful truth that is. His friendship never changes. His love never ceases. His prayers for his people never end. His spirit he gives to his people will never run dry. And the throne of grace is always there when we come to it. His purposes are unbeatable, undefeatable and unassailable. Now, I need to finish. But I need to finish with someone already asking this question. There's times in the Old Testament when it would seem that God changes his mind. Have you ever thought about that? Now, I'm going to deal with the classic one, and it's found in the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah and chapter three and verse 10. You remember how Jonah was sent and uh, God was going to bring judgment on Nineveh. But when he re when they repented, it says this verse 10 of chapter three. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil ways and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. That word relented could also be repented. So does God repent? Does God change his mind? Let me give you a simple illustration. You decide one day to go out for a ride on your bike. It's a very windy day. On your outward journey, the wind is against you and oh, it's hard going. You're puffing and panting. The wind is against you. But when you've gone so far, you decide, well, it's time to go home. And you turn around and you make your way home. But now the wind is behind you and you get, as it were, blown home. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, the wind hasn't changed direction, but you have changed direction. God says, I'm angry with the wicked every day. The sinner is against God and God is against the sinner. But when the sinner repents and turns to Christ and God receives them, the sinner comes into the favour and the friendship of God and into the family of God. And God remains as holy and as just as ever he was. But he's given mercy to the sinner. God hasn't changed his mind. But the sinner has. And God in his love and mercy brings a person to repentance. Man has changed his position. Now, can I ask you in conclusion? Do you know what it is to be in the favour of God? <laughs> you can be against God, you know. You can be in a church against God. 
But when a person owns up to their sin and they turn to God and ask for mercy and forgiveness, do you know something? The blessings of heaven come upon you. And you know what it is to know the blessing of God upon your lives. Now, if you don't know that, why not get alone with God and pray and ask him to forgive you and become your friend and saviour and Lord? Let's have a prayer, shall we? Our gracious God in heaven, we bow before thee and we thank you for the wonderful word of God, how it shows you as the great unchanging God. We thank you, Lord, that in this world of change and confusion, there is a rock on which we can stand, which we can know almighty God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, our gracious Lord, how we are so thankful that we are full of change. The Lord Jesus Christ is the same today as he was yesterday and today and forever. We bless you and we praise you for these wonderful truths. And we pray, Lord, please, that in these days, particularly when they seem to be so fast moving in change, we pray, Lord, please, that we might be soldiers of the cross, followers of the Lamb, knowing that we are truly on the victory side and knowing that Christ within is the hope of glory. Bless us each one we pray, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.